Okay, let's start. We'll pray. Father, we thank you for your blessing and goodness on us this day that you've helped us and brought us to this hour. We've had many things to do and the pressures and tensions of the day, but we ask that you will quicken us, alert our minds, help us to grasp your truth, to treasure it, to make it part of us, and then in turn to share it with others. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I dropped the book, so we'll start out by picking that up and turn with me. We're uh, on page, uh, get the right page here, page uh, five. Last week we were doing these false views of inspiration. And so we're moving on from there. Uh, that was A, we're doing B now, capital letter B, the Bible teaching on inspiration. And again, the, the words, the words are very important. Plenary, plenary means full, complete, total, entire, plenary. Verbal means that inspiration extends to the words, the words, not just the ideas, the concepts, the thoughts, but the words. And so uh, it's not enough to say, it's not enough to think that the Bible's inspired. Uh, many a person would say, oh yes, I believe in the inspiration of the Bible. You don't know what he means by it. It inspires him or what? Or there's just some general divine hovering over the scripture of some kind. But it ha it's complete and it has to do with the words. Go with me to Jeremiah 36 and get ready to start underlining. Jeremiah 36. You have it. Very good. Uh, Old Testament. <laughs> okay. Here we are. Jeremiah 36, 36. I see some of you are still, still looking. It's right where it was last time. All right. It hasn't moved. Uh, 36. Fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. This word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Okay. This is from the Lord. Now. Take a scroll and write. We were on this last week. Uh, these commands to write, they are divine. That the uh, writing is not up to the uh, feeling of the prophet or Bible writer. And write in it and underline words. Words. Verse 2, Jeremiah 36. Words that I have spoken. Drop down to verse 4. Baruch wrote on a scroll all the dictation. In several places in the Bible, the Bible writer uses a secretary. Paul did sometimes. And sometimes it's named is here. Jeremiah used a secretary. On a scroll, the direction of Jeremiah, all the words, words of the Lord. You're underlining words. And then... Down verse 6, uh, in the middle of the verse, uh, all the people in the Lord's house, you shall read the words of the Lord. Words. Now we're down to verse 8 from the scroll. The words. Uh, this, this, this is repetitive and forcefully clear. Verse 10, the hearing of the people, Baruch read, the words of Jeremiah. And again in verse 11, they heard all the words, 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 you're underlining. Verse 13, uh, Micaiah told them all the words he had heard. Verse 16, when they heard all the words, they turned to one another and so on. What must we report all these words to the king? Then verse 17 again, please tell us how you did write all these words. Was it at his dictation? Baruch answered them. He dictated all these words to me. 
And then down in verse 20, uh, they reported all the words to the king. It, it's, it, it doesn't let up. Verse 24, when they heard all these words down into the verse, 24, all these words it was afraid. Now for verse 27, burn the scroll with the words again. And then they were burned. 28, write on it all the former words. And it, it never lets up, this long chapter, down to the last verse, the last half of it. Uh, wrote on it all the dictation of Jeremiah, all the words of the scroll. And then many, at the last sentence, similar words were added to them. In other words, uh, when we're talking about inspiration, it's not just the general idea, the thoughts, the concepts, the ideas that are given to the, to the people who are the writers, but it's, it's, down to, it's down to specific words, 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 words. And uh, that, the repetition in that 36th chapter of Jeremiah is significant. Now let's go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter, we're looking at the first uh, chapter. This is an important text. 2 Peter 1, 21. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were moved or carried along by the Holy Spirit. So <coughs> the author of Scripture is who? More, more specifically, the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who has given us the Scripture, and this is one of his works, one of his functions. So the Scripture then is of what origin? Divine. Divine. It's of divine and not human origin. Now others make a similar claim. Joseph Smith made a claim, you know, for the Book of Mormon, and that this was, and, and the, the Islamic scholars claim that uh, uh, an angel or God gave the Quran to, to Muhammad and so on. I think the answer to this is, you start reading. I have read through the Koran twice, and I'm not going to do it again. The second time was laborious. Uh, once you've read the scripture, uh, you, you don't need a lot of insight to sense a, a, marked, a marked difference between the two. And it is just bedrock in historic, biblical, orthodox Christianity that the scripture is not a book of human origin. God used humans to write it, as we saw from Jeremiah 36, but it is divine, it is supernatural in origin. One indication of this uh, would be, are your wheels turning? that the Bible is not a book of 
human origin, but divine origin. One strong evidence of this. How old it is. It's what? How old it is. Well, there are other writings that are old. Prophecy. Prophecy. Uh, fulfilled prophecy, we have to say. If you go to your Thompson Chain Reference Bible, you'll find, and this is interesting at the present time, uh, time of year that we're in, it has a table of fulfilled prophecy. The Old Testament in the back, in the helps, the Old Testament prophecy, the New Testament fulfillment in the life of Christ in his first coming, one after another, after another, after another. We just came off Palm Sunday last week. You got Zechariah 9.9 9, and with a very plain, indisputable, literal fulfillment on it. Uh, how do you explain these things see, other than th this book is not produced by, by human beings? And uh, so 2 Peter 1.21 is an important text. Uh, not by the will of man. This is not by the said, I'm going to sit down and write part of the Bible today, you know. No, 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 no. But they spoke as they were moved, carried along by the Holy Spirit. Let's go to 2 Timothy 3.16 because this is another anchor kind of, uh, kind of text. 2 Timothy 3, script 16. We'll back up. He's writing, Paul, writing to Timothy, start at 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from who you learned it, and how from childhood, he says, you have been acquainted with the sacred or holy writings which are able to make you wise unto salvation through Christ Jesus. And then comes 16. Uh, uh, the, the key key word in this verse is which one? All. The first word, all. And we were on this last week that it's scripture is not uh, uh, some of it inspired and some not. It's all, all inspired. And so it's not a case of some is more inspired or uh, some not inspired. It's all inspired. All scripture and clear as thing is breathed out by God. That is a very good, uh, good word, good translation. King James and all scriptures given by inspiration. Uh, it has to do again with breathing out, but it's the English is a little old and therefore not not as easy to get a hold of. And because all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, and correction, training in righteousness, so on. Uh, at the time, at the time Paul is writing this, What was scripture? What's he talking about? The Old Testament. Old Testament, basically. Um, much of the new had not been written. And so he's talking about the Old Testament. And that brings us to people who sort of 
denigrate the Old Testament, that, well, that's not very important. Uh, we're New Testament people, and we go by the New Testament. Well, you, you've got severe, severe problems with that. 77% of the Bible is Old Testament. And so if you kind of sideline the Old Testament, you have trashed over three-fourths of Scripture. Furthermore, 32 uh, Two percent, almost a third, of the New Testament is Old Testament quotes. Thirty-two percent. So the New Testament writers didn't have a low view of the Old Testament because a third of what's in the New. There's six hundred quotes from the Old Testament in the New Testament. So anybody who takes the position, well, the Old Testament, you know, that's, that's for the Jews, that's another age. Uh, we're New Testament people, we live by the New Testament, it's all about Jesus, and so on. Uh, have a hard time with that position because of it doesn't line up with what the writers of the New Testament are saying. So 2 Timothy 3.16 is, is, a, is an, 2 Timothy is an anchor. And let's, while we're on this, let's move to Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. The question comes anyone who has a view of the Old Testament, does he agree with Jesus? Matthew 5, let's start with 17. Think not that I have come to destroy or abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So this is the position of, of Christ on the Old Testament, that it's foundational, and, and he came to fulfill it. He's not, not wiping it out. Keep your thumb here and go with me to Acts 24 for a moment. Acts 24, and we're looking at verse, verse 14, 24, 14. This is Paul. But this I confess to you that according to the way, that's a common phrase in the book of Acts, and it refers to Christianity, the way which they call a sect. I worship the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, believing everything laid down by the law and the prophets. In other words, Paul says he is believing everything laid down by the law and the prophets. He doesn't lay it aside. And Jesus says, I didn't come to wipe this out. And uh, so that the Old Testament needs to get its due. Now you look at verse 18. Truly I say to you, until heaven and earth shall pass away. And he's talking about the law. The New Testament didn't exist yet. Till heaven and earth pass away, not I'm in the ESV, iota or dot. KJV, uh, jot or tittle. Uh, what it's, of course, the Old Testament's written in Hebrew. And he's emphasizing what, what, what will not pass away, not a jot or an iota 
This is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet, the Yod. It's about the quarter of a size of the other letters, which are kind of block letters. So not he, as he's saying, not even the smallest letter will pass away. And then he squeezes it tighter. The tittle is just sort of a, a tail on a letter. Uh, it would be comparable to uh, the, the line, let us say, through a capital Q or something in English. It's just part, but it's the smallest part of a letter that just kind of hangs out. Uh, so he's really pressing the point when he says jot or tittle or iota or dot. Uh, not a dot. A dot, I don't know. There was no punctuation in the Hebrew, so a dot is a, a punctuation, but the translators are struggling to get the point across that not anything at all is lost. Uh, and, and so this is the position. I think many a church would say, this is a, the, the common phrase, you know, is a Bible preaching church. A Bible preaching church. We, we believe the Bible. This is a Bible preaching church. Do the Bible classes get into the Old Testament? It's over three-fourths of the Bible. Does the preacher get into the Old Testament? Or is he kind of a, some, you know, a fellow can preach for years on the book of Romans and he's preaching the Bible. He's not preaching all of it. And I, I think there needs to be an alertness on that. In other words, is all of Scripture. It's a Bible, Bible teaching church. Yes, and what's taught is the Bible. But all Scripture is given by inspiration. And it includes, includes the, the Old Testament. Go to, let's take Jesus again, John... John 10, he's under fire here in this chapter. And just sort of embedded in here is a, is a little phrase. It's no more than that, but it's important. John 10, 35. And that is uh, not on the memory list, but it's important. The phrase at the end of 35, Scripture cannot be broken. In other words, it, it, it's solid as a rock. It's just there. You cannot get around it. You cannot deny it. You cannot do away with it. It's, it's just there. Scripture cannot be broken. Now, a very... <clears throat> a very important text we're going to next is Luke 24, 44. This is a, an Easter text, of course. It's Jesus with the two on the road to Emmaus. And there are two passages in here that have to do with the Scriptures. Let's look at 27 first. And he's walking along with them on the way to Emmaus. They don't know who he is. He's concealed himself from them. And it says he starts with Moses and the prophets, verse 27, interpreting to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. This is the point that... What's the Old Testament about? Well, it's about Jesus. He, he says this, and you have the same in, in Acts chapter 8 where Stephen is with the Ethiopian eunuch who's reading from Isaiah, and he points him to Jesus. There's a, if you ever see it and feel up to it, it's a little old, but a multi-volume work by Hengstenberg on Christ in the Old Testament. Uh, 
hundreds and hundreds of pages. Well, let's go to verse 44, because this is where we want to land. It, this, it needs to be understood, and it's exceedingly important. Then he said to them, Jesus to Cleopas and his friend, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me, he's with the disciples and these two back with him, written about me in an underline, the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms must be fulfilled. It'd be easy to slip over this because we're not Jews. These are the three major divisions of the Old Testament by the Jews. The law is what? What? The law, the law. What? Okay, the, the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. This is the law. So when Jesus says the law, he's referring to the Pentateuch, which means the five, the five. And then the prophets, of course. Here are the major, what we call the major and the minor prophets. And then... And the way the Jews divided and thought, when they said the Psalms, they meant all the poetical books. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, all of them. So what you have here, and then... The Law of Moses, the Five, the Prophets, the Psalms. You have, with these three phrases, the entire Old Testament covered. Now this, this leads us to the question that had been raised earlier in this class, and we hit it very briefly. The question of canonicity. By canon, we mean what books are Bible books? And if you find uh, some place an old Bible, you may find some apocryphal books in it. If you find a Roman Catholic Bible, you will find books in addition to what's on this list in there. First, Second Maccabees, Judith, Bell and the Dragon, and Tobit, and some others. About 14 or 16 of them. And in talking with Catholic people, <coughs> somebody may say to you, you, you Protestants, they mean, have taken books out of the Bible. Ever get that in a conversation? No, you don't talk to Catholic people. <laughs> What? Most of them have no idea. They have no idea. Now and then you'll get somebody who may throw that at you. Okay. To which, you know, it's easy to get into a knockout argument. But what you say then is, when were they taken out? And what was taken out? Well, they probably don't know. They're not that. They just heard somebody say that we uh, took books out of the Bible. Those other books, about 16 of them, were added by the Council of Trent, which uh, started meeting in 1546. And... The Council of Trent was an anti-Protestant council. It was called by the Pope to do away with all the heirs of Luther and Calvin and the Reformers. And so they're establishing 
uh, what was, quote, the Bible. And they included those books. And that's the date. Now, 1546 is a little late to be adding to Scripture. Quite a little late, by the way. The truth is that the Old Testament was established uh, two, three hundred years, four hundred years before Christ by the Jews and Jesus recognizes this list of books, the 39 that we call the Old Testament, that he designates here as the Law of Moses, the Pentateuch, the Prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and the rest, and, and then the poetical books. Question. All right, what about like 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, Chronicles, Judges, what about all those? Like, what would they fall under? Because in Awanas, we were taught that they are not either the minor or major prophets or the so. The, the Jews bundled them up with the prophets. Okay. Samuel was a prophet. Yeah. Samuel was a prophet, see. Okay. So that's where they fall. But here, here you have it. So we're, when we're talking about canon, which is what books are Bible books, that was not settled by some church council in the fourth century. This was settled before you ever heard of John the Baptist or Christ was born. This, this is all t taken care of several hundred years before that. And all Jesus did was put his stamp of approval on this and recognize that these are the Bible books and these are what is the Old Testament, the Scripture. So, so for, yes? For the other, like, all the books the Catholics added, did they, like, write those for the Council of Trent or those been around? Oh, them? no, they had been around. Yeah. Rem remember, when the Bible's being written, there are a lot of other writings, too. The Greeks were writing, Herodotus was doing his history, and... Thucydides, his Peloponnesian Wars, and Homer was writing, and uh, you know, the Bible writers weren't the only people who could write. There was a lot of, there were thousands of tablets in the library at Nineveh, uh, and most of them today sitting in the British Museum numbered 2,000 something and on, on up. Uh, people, the Egyptians wrote, and uh, and so there, there were a lot of writings. So it's not just that the Bible was the only thing written. And, and, and these others, most of those apocryphal books date back into the intertestament period. Uh, three, four hundred. First and second Maccabees uh, tells about the wars of the Jews and his history. But uh, there they're not Bible books, never recognized. Yes? So we're talking by inspiration. Are we allowed to say that the, um, the authors interacted with, you know, Paul interacts with the Epicurean philosophies of the Greeks, he even quotes Greek literature at one point. Acts 17. Yeah. Uh, Jude and, and uh, First Peter interact with Book of Enoch, Shepherd of Hermas. So are, they, is this a part of the inspiration where they actually learn from the sources and God inspires them to write? The, to, to put that down. Yeah. They, they knew these other writings existed, obviously, and had read them. Yeah. Uh, don't confine them to, you know, just the Old Testament. I think the, the false view that uh, is given a lot is that sort of God puts these people into a trance and they start to auto write. Uh, no, that's no, not, no. That's not what we're talking about here. No, we're not talking about dictation. No. All right. So where were we? There. Now, let's go to 2 Peter 3. This is a fascinating way. 2 Peter already. Let's get back there. Without question, you know, uh, Peter's heavy on the scene. 
In the Gospels, the first 12 chapters of the book of Acts, uh, just because our Catholic friends say he was the first pope doesn't mean that Peter wasn't important. He was exceedingly important. He, he was the lead apostle, there's no question. And the one who did more talking than anybody else in the Gospels, and he has these two letters. So we're in Second Peter 3. So let's start with verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found in him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul. Hey, that was nice since Paul had rebuked him once, you know, uh, told him off. They mended, obviously. Our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in... So you underline Paul, and you're underlining in 16 all his letters. Peter is aware of Paul's letters, which are half the books of the New Testament. When he speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist of their own destruction, as they do, and now you're underlining, the other scriptures. What does the Apostle Peter do with Paul's letters? What? He ties them together with the other scripture. Yes, he calls them what? Scripture. scripture. So when someone tries to press upon you that uh, canon was determined by some church council in the fourth century, uh, well, you got the Old Testament cared for hundreds of years before that. The Old Testament is settled before there's any New Testament. And then you have Peter saying very f forcefully that Paul's letters are Scripture. Yes? Do we know that all Paul's letters are in the Bible? Not necessarily. In other words, what you're saying is that everything that Paul wrote during his whole lifetime, is it, is it in the Bible? Well, not necessarily. Then, but these, these that we have are, are Scripture. We don't have anything else. And, you know, some make a lot about They talk about, well, the inspiration of Scripture and the preservation, the preser... Well, obviously it's been preserved. You have it, you know. So what's the big deal? What's the point that, uh, that, that we, we have it as, uh, after 2,000 years? So... Uh, to, to thump on that is rather useless. It just you, you hold it in your hands, you know. Sure, it's been preserved. Of course, it's been preserved. Now, uh, we're, we're back to, to again to Second Timothy three sixteen. That all Scripture is given by inspiration. It's the entire Bible. All of it. And it's not partial, but complete. Now, not just the thoughts, but the words. We started there. And if you weren't here when we read through Jeremiah 36, do it on your own. And underline when it keeps saying the words, the words, the words. So let's go to Second Samuel. This is David. Second Samuel. 23 
And David, of course, has given us the Psalms and so on. Second Samuel 23, 2. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me in his what? Word is in my tongue. We're down to the words. So uh, here's another Bible author. And you have later on, we're coming to, of course, this very clear, clear statement. While we're in the Old Testament here, let's go to Jeremiah 1, 9. Jeremiah 1, 9. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. So it's not just the ideas, the concepts, the thoughts that God gave to these Bible writers and then they just spun them out any way they wanted. No, I put my words in your mouth. It's clear as crystal. Go with me now, since we're here, back a little bit to Isaiah, Isaiah 52 and to pick up a, a, a similar a similar text. Isaiah, and we're looking at Isaiah, uh, I'm sorry, 51, 16, 51, 16. And you're underlining, and I put my words in your mouth, says God to, to Isaiah. What could be, uh, what could be clearer clearer than that. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And we're starting at verse... Uh, let's start at 10. These things God has revealed. There are some words that you, 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 I'm going to hold your feet to the fire. You have to know what's meant by revelation, general and special. You have to know what's meant by inspiration. You have to know what's meant by plenary and verbal inspiration. So here we go. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a, a person's thoughts except the Spirit of the person which is in him. So no one, also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand that's illumination, which is we're going to come to later. The things given to us by God, and now verse 13. We impart this in words. Words. Not generalities, not thoughts, but words. Not as human wisdom, but taught us by the Spirit. Words taught us by the Spirit. Now you have to think through these things because we live in a day of uh, slippery words. Again, there, there are preachers, Bible teachers, professors in colleges, seminaries, you can ask, you believe the Bible's inspired? No. Look you straight in the eye and say, well, of course I do. And then they'll teach that it has mistakes in it. And that inspiration uh, has just to do with the spiritual things, like John 3.16. But it had, does not have to do with the history in uh, First and Second Kings or First and Second Chronicles. It doesn't have to do with 
dates. It does not have to do with uh, any allusions to the natural world and, and so on. And so you, so you have to be very, very discerning when, when you come to this. And people are easily bamboozled by people who uh, don't, we're, we're on Easter here again and just say, you, you know, there are many a preacher you can say, do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, of course I do. But you asked the wrong question. You should have asked bodily. Do you believe in the bodily? the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, that tightens it up, see, because he believed in the resurrection of the influence of Jesus, the resurrection uh, of his spirit. Of course, his influence never died, his spirit never died. So this is rubbish. Uh, all that was there, all that died was the body, so that's the only thing you can be talking about in the resurrection. But there's a lot of slippery talk under the label of Christianity. Now, uh, we're going next time into the proof of inspiration. And we're going to start checking up next week to see how you're getting a hold of this stuff. And that should be enlightening and helpful. Uh, all right. So, yes, that was a warning. <laughs> so let's pray. Father, we thank you for your help and goodness. Give us hearts that love you, minds that are diligent in pursuing your truth. Give us discernment, we pray, that we may not be swept away by deceitful teachers, but know carefully what you have taught us in the Word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.